Nicholas Kristof, columnist for the New York Times, oh. got under your skin, and not for the first time. Readers of your column will know. New York Times writer Nicholas Kristof, I'm quoting you, asserts that there is overwhelming, you're quoting him, overwhelming evidence that centuries of racial subjugation still shape inequity in the 21st century, quote, closing quote, and he mentions, open quote, the lingering effects of slavery, close quote. And now this is Tom Sowell. If we wanted to be serious about evidence, we might compare where blacks stood 100 years after the end of slavery with where they stood after 30 years of the liberal welfare state. Yes. Explain that. Well, in 1960, which would be almost 100 years after the end of slavery, 22% right. of black kids grew up in homes with only one parent. Just 22%? Yes. Four out of five were in homes with both parents. Yes. Uh, 30 years later, after the liberal welfare state, that number had more than tripled. And so I say, well, let us compare, if, if we, we can speculate on how much that 22% was due to the legacy of slavery. But we know that that tripling was not due to the legacy of slavery. It was due to the legacy of a whole different set of policies. And you can, and, and you can look at it so many other ways. Uh, education. Uh, Stuyvesant High School in New York, as you know, you get into only by passing a very tough exam. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, the percentage of black students who had gotten into Stuyvesant High School was less than one-tenth of the percentage of black students who had gotten into Stuyvesant High School 33 years earlier. I didn't know that. There's, there's Dunbar High School in Washington, which was an elite black high school for a very long time, in 1993, the number of uh, kids out of Dunbar High School who went on to college was less than it was 60 years earlier, which would have been in the depth of the Great Depression. Uh, and so you can run through a whole bunch of other things like that. Uh, look at the housing projects. Uh, the housing projects in the first half of the 20th century, during that first hundred years after slavery, uh, were had, did not have the high crime rates, the murder rates, uh, the graffiti, uh, the, all the rest of it. We, we associate, none of that was there. Uh, people, uh, in fact, the New York Times, I should, uh, uh, Christoph should read his own pa old papers, uh, uh, pointed out that on Saturday mornings, it was common in the housing project of this earlier era mm -hmm. for, for parents to leave their doors unlocked because some of the parents could afford television, some couldn't. So the ones who had television would leave their doors unlocked, and the kids from the other families could come down there and watch television with them. Well, now the latest figures show that uh, most people below the poverty line have two television sets and cable, but they wouldn't dare leave their doors unlocked in a public housing project. I'm quoting that column again. Liberals have wreaked more havoc on blacks than the supposed legacy of slavery they talk about. Yes. You don't mean that hyperbolically. No, I do not. You mean it. Yeah. I, one, 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 another thing, um, crime and, and violence. Uh, now we take it for granted that there's crimes, tremendous levels of crime and violence uh, in the black community. That was not always the case. In the 20s, it was very common for white celebrities, including George Gershwin and William Faulkner, to go up to Harlem not only for entertainment places, but to go into private homes of kid, people they knew. Uh, and Gershwin played Rhapsody in Blue and, 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 and this, this home where, where Walter White lived. Uh, Milton Friedman, when he was a graduate student at, at Columbia, he and the lady he later married would go dancing at the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem. And he said, we had no fear of being uh, mugged or accosted on the street or anything like that. You've told, I've heard you say, Tom, when you were a boy growing up in Harlem yourself, mm -hmm. th th your own neighborhood felt totally safe to you. Not, not totally safe to you. I, I wouldn't exaggerate, but it's nothing resembling today. I mean, I did sleep on hot, hot nights. I would sleep out on the fire escape. When I tell people in Harlem that today, they, they think I'm, I'm, I'm from another galaxy, you know. But that people slept in, in, uh, on the fire escapes uh, in New York and in the public parks in the 30s, all over the city, because because it was not like it was not a jungle. What there was a lady. I'll, one other example. Mm -hmm. There was a woman who was uh, a black woman in Harlem who was an actress. She'd be I'd go down to the theater district, and then after the play, you know, they'd have their 
drinks and eat something or whatever. And she said at one o'clock in the morning, she would simply get on the subway and go on up to Harlem uh, and, 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 and walk home from there. Now, it so happens that the subway station she got off at was right very near a, 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 a grocery store where I was a delivery boy. And on Saturday nights, I would be working usually until around midnight. And when I would go home, I would go past that very same subway station she's talking about. I never had the slightest trouble. So if the comparison between progress, simply the decency of, the, of, yes. of life available yes. to people, they weren't, to, black, the, the families were intact mm. and schools worked and the neighborhoods were more yeah. or less safe. Yes. The people were able to lead decent lives. If the contrast between that world and the world we inhabit now is owing so directly to the to liberal policies mm. intended, mm. so we're told, to help African Americans. Why do African Americans support the liberal, the more liberal of the two parties, the Democratic Party, at the rates of 90 and more percent? Why is the first African American president so deeply committed to promoting and extending liberal policies? Why is his African American attorney general Again, so, so deeply committed to af affirmative action and other, why? This makes well, no sense. Well, well uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think we could be enough hours for me to answer all of those. But uh, to take the political thing, one of the things I discovered in the research from my, from my book I'm currently working on is that leaders of groups that are lagging in countries around the world uh, almost invariably have counterproductive policies for them. And it makes perfect sense because insofar as members of lagging groups assimilate into the values and uh, achievements of the larger society, uh, they don't need those leaders. Uh, you know, and uh, you, you see this, you look, uh, look at the history of the Czechs in the 19th century. People are worried that the Czechs are all learning to speak German. Well, at that time, if you wanted to become a a professional person, scientist, anything like that, uh, you had to use books that were written in German. Right. Simply because the German acquired a, a, a volume of literature centuries ahead of, of Czech. Uh, and yet they, they fought tooth and nail against that. Uh, if you look at the, uh, in Sri Lanka, one of the arguments that was made there to the Buddhist uh, leaders was that if we don't do something, the, the Tamil minority will assimilate members of the, of the, of the uh, 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 Sinhalese uh, majority. And then there'll be no Buddhists or Sinhalese in another several ge generations. And so, I mean, there's no, there's no mystery to me as to why Jesse Jackson says what he does or Al Sharpton and others, because that benefits them but it does not benefit the people they lead. And all the incentives are for, are for leaders to lead people uh, into things that, that don't help the people, but help the leaders. What?